Okay, the use of private investment companies in private banking. All right. In offshore or international financial centers, private banking customers are often non-residents, meaning they conduct their banking in a country outside the one in which they reside. So usually when people are, are wealthy, they have access to resources which can do this. Their assets may move overseas where they are held in the name of corporate vehicles like private investment companies established in secrecy havens. PICs are corporations established by individual bank customers and others in offshore jurisdictions to hold assets. There are shell companies formed to maintain clients' confidentiality and various tax or trust related issues. So a lot of things like trusts uh, and organizational structures are heavy with this. They have been an element of many high profile laundering cases in recent years because they are excellent laundering vehicles. The secrecy laws of the offshore havens where the private investment companies are often established can conceal the true identity of the beneficial owner. So they start having these sort of more complex uh, organizational ownership structures and from that, that's how they sort of try to sort of hide the beneficial owner. As an additional layer of secrecy, some PICs are established by company formation agents with nominee directors. So a nominee director is when you have another director who's sort of just does director, signs documents, it's just the director, the official director of the document, but they're not the actual director. Who hold title to a company for the benefit of individuals. These beneficial owners may remain undisclosed and sometimes subject to an attorney-client privilege or other similar legal safeguards. Many private banks establish PICs for their clients. So obviously the banks are heavily involved, they're doing it, they're sorting it out themselves, you know. Um, often through an affiliated trust company or an offshore secrecy haven. Illicit actors may establish complex shell company networks where a company registered in one juri off offshore jurisdiction may be linked to companies or accounts in other offshore jurisdictions. Okay, that's cool. Let's keep going. Case study. In 2014, Israeli bank, uh, bank Luemi admitted that it assisted more than 1,500 US taxpayers in hiding their assets in Bank Luimi's offshore affiliates in Switzerland and Luxembourg. According to reports for several years, Bank Luimi sent private bankers to the United States to meet with its US clients to discuss their offshore portfolio and tax mitigation strategies. I love that word, tax mitigation strategies. As part of this, the bank assisted in organizing nominee corporate entities registered in Belize. Belize is a uh, Obviously, it's in the Caribbean, but it's also a UK jurisdiction, essentially. So it's Commonwealth. So that's common law. And other offshore jurisdictions to hide their clients' private offshore accounts and maintained several US clients' accounts under the assumed names or numbered accounts. Bank Luimi also provided hold mail services and offered loans to its US clients that were collateralized by their offshore assets that were not declared to US tax authorities. As a result of the settlement, Bank Luimi was assessed at $270 million, fi million in fines and its bank was ordered to cease providing private banking and investment services for all U.S. clients or accounts with the U.S. beneficial owners. This settlement led to Bank Luimi selling its affiliate, Bank Luimi Private Bank and Bank Luimi Luxembourg. Okay, so Luxembourg and Switzerland are kind of private bank havens, essentially. All right, politically exposed persons here. According to the FAT, it's International Standards on Combating Money Laundering and the Financing of Terrorism and Proliferation, 2012, there are two types of politically exposed persons. Uh, this is still relevant, by the way, even though it's only 10 years old. Foreign PEPs. This is, the, this is mainly who you're looking for when it comes to PEPs. Foreign PEPs, individuals who have been entrusted with prominent public functions by a foreign country, e.g. heads of state or of government, senior politicians, senior government, judicial or military officials, senior executives of state-owned corporations, and important political party officials. Domestic PEPs, individuals who are or have been entrusted domestically with prominent public functions, e.g. heads of state or of government, senior politicians, senior government, judicial or military officials, senior executives of state-owned corporations, and important political party officials. PEPs have been the source of problems for several financial institutions, as the examples below show. Mario Villanueva, the corrupt governor of the Mexican state of Quintana Roo, facilitated the smuggling of 200 tons of cocaine into the United States, according to the U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency, the DEA, for five years, until 2001. So this is 20 years ago. He maintained private banking accounts at Lehman Brothers. So even back then, you know, these, these U.S. banks, like Lehman Brothers, big bank, you could, you could do this, you could have accounts. Containing approximately 20 million that the DEA alleged he had received in bribes from Mexican drug traffickers. <laughs> 
The Riggs Bank case revealed a web of transactions involving hundreds of millions of dollars of the bank that had facilitated over many years for dictators on two continents, including Augusto Pinochet of Chile and Teodoro Obayang of Equatorial Guinea. The accounts formed part of the embassy banking portfolio that was the bank's specialty product for decades. Vladimiro Montesinos, the former head of Peru's intelligence service and chief advisor of the former Peruvian president Alberto Fujimori, had accounts at the Bank of New York in New York City, where he held proceeds from substantial bribes from drug traffickers. Other institutions, such as American Express Bank International, Bank of America, Barclays, UBS AG in New York, also held accounts for Montesinos. In addition, he used shell companies to facilitate embezzlement, gun running, drug trafficking, money laundering, and just supported million globally. Okay, so even at those major banks were still able to, you know, do all these sort of private banking, private wealth type tax mitigation structures. Arnaldo Alamán and Byron Huérez, the former president and tax and former tax commissioner of Nicaragua, maintained accounts at Terra Bank NA in Miami. Any bank in Miami is not going to be good through which they bought millions of dollars of certificates and deposits and condominiums in South Florida, allegedly with the proceeds of corruption. Pavel Lazarenko, the former Prime Minister of Ukraine, had accounts in San Francisco at Bank of America, Commercial Bank, Pacific Bank, West America Bank, and various securities firms including Fleet Boston, Robertson, Robertson Stevens, Hambrick and Quist, and Merrill Lynch, where millions of dollars were allegedly extorted as head of state of Ukraine were held. Colonel Victor Venero Garrido, a Peruvian army officer whom the US FBI described as the most trusted straw bag man, the trusted straw bag of Vladimir Montesinos, maintained accounts at Citibank in Miami and Northern Trust in California and allegedly held more than 15 million in bribes and, and extortion proceeds. Mario Ruiz Macio, the former Deputy General of Mexico in charge of drug trafficking precautions, maintained a private bank account at Texas Columbus Bank in Houston in the mid-1990s where he deposited drug traffickers, bribes and nine million currency over a 13 month period. So when you were, but back in the day you could have done this stuff much easier, you know what I mean? Uh, Omar Bongo, the president of Gabon in Central Africa for 41 years until his death in 2009, Bongo used offshore shell companies to move over 100 million suspected funds through private bank accounts including providing large amounts of cash to family members for his benefit. Okay, we're gonna start looking at some, some sort of financial crime sort of methods. So this one is structuring. Um, Designing, transa designing a transaction to evade triggering or uh, reporting or record keeping requirement is called structure. Okay, so when you have a record, so $10,000 usually, it depends on the jurisdiction, but at $10,000 you have to file a, a currency transaction report. Obviously, if you have a million dollars, not a million dollars, just say $100,000, you know, you're gonna file a pretty serious currency transaction report. So in this case here, you basically, you try to avoid it by basically depositing, you know, if you want to deposit $30,000, or you know, you go 9,000, 9,000, 9,000, 7,000, you know, that type of thing. Um, structuring is possibly the most common known money laundering method. It is a crime in many countries and must be reported by filing a suspicious activity report. The individuals engaged in structuring may be runners hired by the launderers. Um, these individuals go from bank to bank depositing cash and purchasing monetary uh, instruments in amounts under reporting thresholds. Structuring can be done in many, setting, many settings or industries, um, including banking, money service businesses, and casinos, a lot of cash, basically. A common technique involved in structuring is called smurfing, which involves multiple individuals making multiple cash deposits and or buying multiple monetary instruments or bank charts in amounts under the reporting threshold in an attempt to evade detection. Okay, interesting. Cash structuring example, so we've got one here. $40,000, Monday, 9,000, Tuesday, 9,000, Wednesday, 4,000, Thursday, 9,000, Friday, 10,000, $40,000. So there's a lot of, um, you know, there's a lot of um, basically financial sort of tr transaction monitoring, a lot of now predictive analytics that goes after this sort of structuring. You know, it's like AI in terms of looking for structuring. So it's pretty impressive. Structure remains one of the most common reported forms of unusual activity. Below are some well-known examples. A customer brings a large transaction into two or more smaller ones. Henry wants to conduct a transaction involving $18,000 in cash. However, knowing that depositing it all at once would exceed the cash reporting threshold of $10,000 in cash, that would trigger a filing of a currency transaction report. He goes into three different banks and deposits $6,000 in each. A large transaction is broken into two or more smaller transactions conducted by two or more people. 
Jennifer wants to send $5,000 money transaction transfer, but knowing that in her country there is a threshold of $3,000. For recording the funds transfer, she needs to send $2,500 in money transfer, and she asks her friend to send the other $2,500. So there. A wealthy Chinese man sends his fortune across to London. Mr. Lee sends his gain wealth of £1 million and sums of $40,000 via friends and business contacts to a British bank in London. The reason why he's not sending out of his own bank account in London is because the Chinese government has currency controls in place for transactions over $50,000 abroad. Okay. Case study structuring has been around for a long time, as it is evidenced by the case from the early 1980s. Although this case is old, the method continues to be used, breaking down transactions below the reporting threshold. Isaac Catton was a travel agent and businessman. Catton allegedly mourned an estimated $500 million per year in drug money, all of it cash. Couriers from a number of cities would visit him in his apartment, leaving boxes and suitcases full of money. The bagmen were messages from narcotics distributors. The money was a payment to their su for their suppliers in Columbia. One of Catton's favorite places for making deposits was the Great American Bank of Dade County, Miami. Officials in the banks were bribed to accept his massive deposits without filing currency transaction reports. Interesting. Hernan Botero allegedly had a similar but smaller operation to Catton. He laundered only about $100 million per year from cocaine deals out of his home near Palm Beach. Botero was indicted by the US United States let's go through this United States and testimony in federal court showed that he had bribed officers and employees of the landmark bank in Plantation, Florida to accept his deposits. The money was brought in the bank the bank almost daily by Botero front companies from landmark. Yeah, well they bring in the money every day on daily issue. It's gonna be, you know, risk. Botero Frank from Landmark. The money was transferred to the Miami accounts of Colombian banks. From there it was a simple matter of to wire the money to banks in Colombia. Catton and Montero were sentenced to 30 year terms in federal prison. Okay. So let's stop there.